So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Yeah. All right. In this video, I want to talk about a typical conversation with someone like a Roman Catholic or someone who's Orthodox. And I'm going to show you a line of questioning that I would use to talk to them. Now, this platform and the way I'm setting it up here is very simple, very easy to do, but people are not going to follow along, right? Because they know where it's leading. It's leading to the truth. And it's the truth that they don't want to accept, so they're not going to quite follow along with it. But this is how it would go if the person was actually genuine and cared about the truth. So, let's switch to color here, something that stands out a little bit. Let's start off right here. And this starts off with a fella telling me that he believes we need to rely on Bible plus traditions. So, the written traditions plus oral traditions. And I ask the simple question, why? Why do you believe this? The person actually went over here and said, well, because the Bible says from Paul that we should listen to what he has written to them plus what he has told them orally and follow the traditions. I was like, oh, so you believe we should follow the oral traditions because the Bible says so. You're proving the Bible alone. Or I put here the Bible only. B-O. Probably should have put alone. Right? I should have put an A there. So let's do that because I just realized B.O., right? I don't need Roman Catholics and Orthodox mocking such things, right? So, ba, right? Like Abba, Father. That's a little better, right? So, uh, using the Bible to prove to rely, you, you need to rely on oral traditions shows that the Bible is the ultimate authority, Right? Because you can't say, well, the oral traditions say to rely on them. So, the oral traditions don't have any authority. Prove they got any authority. Oh, to prove they got authority, you need to use the written word. Well, guess what? How do I prove the written word has, is the authority? Well, it's the inspired word of God. And you maybe say, oh, well, that's tradition. Well, maybe for you that's tradition. But I didn't grow up a believer. I believe the word of God is is inspired by God because I've actually gone through it and tested it, compared it to history, compared it to science, and delved into the prophecies where I am thoroughly convinced that the Bible is true and it's inspired by God and has even told us the future that is happening right now before our eyes worldwide and focusing on Israel right now. It's foretold us of these things, and people have been warning of these things for years because the Bible has foretold it, right? I have no reason to doubt it. It's its authority because it's basically God's representative here on earth. You don't need to establish its authority. Like God, what does he have to do to establish his authority? Stomp on your head, right? Right? He's gone, all right? He spoke everything into existence. Everything is held together because of him, right? 
Do you really want him to prove that by just like letting you go so that you just fall apart into nothing? I mean, think about it. Uh, but anyway, but another way some of these people go is they'll say, oh, I believe we should rely on the written or old traditions because the church says so. So then it leads to this next question here. Well, why do you trust the church? And then they might say something like, oh, well, the Bible, like a Roman Catholic would say, Matthew 16, right? Oh, so you're using the Bible to prove the church's authority. So you're showing, again, the Bible alone as the Bible is the ultimate authority here. It all traces back to the Bible alone. But they don't like that. It's the truth, but they don't like it. So they try to get away from it. So I've had one person say, oh, why do you trust the church? Oh, because they're guided by the Holy Spirit. So then again, you would ask the question, why? And I didn't put that here. So let's put that in there. And then you ask them, well, why do you believe the Holy Spirit is with the church or your church? Oh, well, the Bible says, again, you just proved the Bible alone, that the Bible has authority. Because each one of these steps, you believe what you believe because the Bible supports it. At least your view and your interpretation and understanding of the Bible supports it, showing that ultimately the Bible is the ultimate authority. But then they still don't want to accept it, and that's where I just put a question mark here. Where are you going to go from there? And usually where they go from there is just a bunch of mocking and scoffing, changing the subject. And that's why I have, let's use a different color for down here. I have this right here. It looks kind of like an R. And I did something weird to it because I was trying to make it look like a P and an R put together. Because then all of a sudden they'll just jump to something different such as Peter's the Rock. Right? And that's why I was like, okay, let's go through this line of questioning. Why do you believe... Peter is the rock. That's a weird looking why and question mark, but why do you believe this? And they might come to the answer, oh, well, the Bible says it. Matthew 16. Well, guess what? You just showed the Bible is the authority. Because in order to prove this, you don't just say, well, it's obvious. It's right there. It proves itself like God, right? Like the Bible. No, you have to say, oh, the Bible. The Bible says it, so therefore, it's true, thus proving Bible alone. Oh, but then they might say, uh, because the church, right? But once they do that, again, you ask the whole why and that just leads you down this same path right here so there's no reason to really type that out again uh, but then i thought there was a third answer i was going to bring up here that sometimes is the response oh another line of question that i was going to bring up is why do you trust the church right you say oh because the church says that's what how the interpretation goes okay why do you trust their interpretation i'll put a t there why do you trust the interpretation and you see now this usually puts them into a little bit of a conflict they'll and a lot of times you'll just get word salad from them, stuff that doesn't have anything to do with what you're talking about because they don't want to actually think about it they have never been taught to actually truly think and to think critically. A lot of times what they are given is basically parroted answers, right? So that's all they're capable of doing. They memorize a, like a script. When you ask a question, they give the answer. When you don't accept it, they like, oh, that's because you're, you're devil possessed. You're a heretic. Or, you know, there's something wrong with you. Because you're thinking for yourself and you're not just accepting what they're saying. So when you ask a question that's not on the script, like why do you trust the church in its interpretation? 
they have to sit there and pause and be like, well, why do I? Ultimately, the answer is because they, 99% of the time, they grew up in that church. That's why it's ingrained in them, right? They just grew up, just like you grew up with your, your parents, you trust them because you grew up with them, even though your parents may not even be trustworthy. But they still have your trust because they're your parents, right? And that's ultimately what it comes down to because they don't have anything that they can rely on because the church tells them that they cannot interpret the scriptures themselves. They either need the magisterium, which is the clergy, you know, the, the priests and what have you, and or the traditions, right? So they need to use that to interpret the scriptures. But then you ask them, well, why do you trust the church in its traditions? And they can't give an answer because they can't say it's their interpretation of the Bible because they can't interpret themselves. They have to use the church in its interpretation because they're the only ones that can interpret it. So they're put into this dilemma here. And that's where I, there's a whole lot of sh short circuiting and they never really want to focus on it. They get caught into this. This circle, right? Like a snake eating its tail, right? And it's just never ending because they're like, oh, the church gives authority to the Bible, but then the Bible gives authority to the church. So which one has the authority? You, If you say the church, well, where does it get its authority? The Bible. Oh, so the Bible's authority. No, because it gets its authority from the church. And you just go in a circle, da, 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 and you go nowhere. There's no growth. There's no nothing. It's just going in this circle, like uh, an insane person. And then it's the same thing when it comes to interpretation, where they say we, they're the only ones that can properly interpret it. So I'm going to put a P I for not private investigator, but for uh, the only proper interpretation and how do they come to that conclusion well the bible says they're the only ones that can privately interpret it or properly interpret it my bad so then is it the bible that gives them that authority is whose interpretation oh their interpretation that they have the the ability to do the interpreting so how they get the ability to interpret oh, from the Bible, according to whose interpretation, their interpretation, and then you're just caught into this loop. And uh, a lot of times, what you get is instead of them admitting that they're in this circular loop of nonsense, and this is basically what we're seeing here is the fork tongue. Of a snake here just like I, I talk about with like the Roman Catholic Church where they say oh you're saved by works and grace it's like coming to a T intersection right you're coming down this road right you're coming down here but then you come to a crossroads you can go left or you can go right as Romans 11 6 tells us that grace if it has works, it's no more grace. And if works has grace, it's no more works. These things are polar opposites. So you have to choose which way do you go, works or grace. And the Catholic Church says both. So you can't go both ways, so you're just stuck in the same circle. And it comes from the same mouth as the serpent. The serpent keeps giving you these contradicting views that get you to be just stuck in place. Like... A, uh, hypnagogic state like uh, in the jungle book where the snake would hypnotize you see that this circular reasoning it, it, that's basically what it does it's just a little hypnotic spiral like every time you see those hypnotists they use their little spiraling and that's exactly what this is the serpent speaks with a forked tongue with contradictions and it, it creates this mesmerizing circle that puts people in this hypnotic state where they just don't understand anything. And instead of realizing, hey, this is wrong, I'm going to get away from it, they just submit to it. 
You'd be like, oh, I'm I just too stupid to understand. I'm just going to submit everything to this, this agency that will do my thinking for me. And it's all because of this little mind trick. Speaking these things that should wake them up, but instead of actually focusing and realizing, hey, I'm caught into this circular reasoning hypnotic state, instead of waking up to it, what they'll end up doing is just, let's, let's use a different color here. Uh, let's use purple. Uh, you, you get them to, you're, you actually have them here, right? Where they're starting to see that they're following the snake. They don't really want to face that. So they'll jump over here to something. And when you're like, hey, hey, get back over here, right? Let's put an F here. Focus, focus on what's going on. Oh no, what about over here? You know, like this. Oh, Luther, Luther's a peckerhead. King James was a was a homosexual. Be like, okay, all right, cool. Focus over here though. Look at this, it's circular reasoning. Oh, what about over here? Protestants, uh, look at them, all stupid. And you're like, okay, all right, yeah, focus here. What's going on over here, though? Look at what you're ignoring. Oh, but look at this, look at this over here. Like uh, the early church fathers, when they don't actually mean Jesus and the apostles were the early church fathers, just saying, oh, the people, look at what they believed and said. Okay, yeah, all right, whatever, that doesn't matter. What about here? Focus, focus, and then jumping over here. And then a lot of times what it'll end up doing is like that meme you've probably seen where uh, it's a, a guy playing chess with a pigeon and the pigeon just messes up the board and walks all over it. So it doesn't matter if you present the evidence and you win the argument. Uh, this is basically what they'll do to your whole thing and just start trolling and all this. And by this time, you should just be walking away, right? You've done what you could. You shouldn't stress yourself out, right? You can't force people to accept the truth, right? You can lead them to water, but you can't make them drink. And before they even get to this point, uh, you should just end up walking away. Uh, and online, you do that. You can just block them or something, right? Or ignore them and just no longer engage with them. Because even at this time, if you ignore them, a lot of times they'll start really pushing, right? They'll leave a lot of comments on any post you put in a forum, or they'll start private messaging you. And even though you ignore them, sometimes they just keep pushing. You just block them. You're like, well, hey, Paul said, you don't have to tell them this. But Paul said, hey, you, you, you try to reach somebody, right? You're trying to admonish them and reason with them. But after the second time, a lot of times you give them more than two times. Uh, let them be as a heretic. And like Jesus say, hey, if they don't receive you, dust off your feet and walk to another place. Right? So if they're doing all this, obviously they're showing themselves to be pigs and swine. And Jesus said again, not to give your pearls to pigs and swine. Because what will they do? They will rend the truth and they will rend you as well. As in just tear you all up. And you can see that while talking to these uh, Catholics and Orthodox and like-minded Christians, that it's like doing an exorcism at times, because they seem very reasonable, right? And all of a sudden, you get in the Word of God to them, you're starting to convict them, and all of a sudden, it's like you just... By preaching the word of God to him, you just sprinkled holy water on him from the movies. And all of a sudden the demons are like, Aah! and going nuts, right? And you're just like, okay. But you see, you can't set the person free from the devil because they want to stay there with him. Right? It's about also their choice. Right? Because you can't cast the devil out of someone who has welcomed him there. Right? Like you can't cast somebody out of somebody else's house. You can cast them out of your house. Right? Or out of somebody's house who wants to be helped. Right? But if somebody's like, I want the devils here. 
they're welcome. I'm going to side with them over you. Well, then there's nothing you can do about it. It's their own free will. You can't take that away from them. Right? Just like Satan can't force us to be lost. It's based on our free will. And you can't force people to be saved. Uh, but, uh, yeah. With all that being said, I think you understand it now. This is usually how conversations go. And uh, that's that, right? What are you going to do? You, you can reason all you want, but they'll fight this tooth and nail. Like the more self-controlled ones, they'll just keep going and going and going and going and repeating the same things over and over. I would say just block those people as well. They're just distracting you and wasting your time. Right? Because if they won't accept the truth in the beginning of something simple, like let's say it's something simple, like two plus two is four, they are rejecting that. Well, if they're going to jump to another subject, why talk about the other subject with them when they're just going to do the same thing and reject the truth? They're like, no, you just rejected that two plus two is four. You're showed that you're not a reasonable person. I'm not going to waste my time talking to you if every time I present the truth to you, you just spit in my face. No, goodbye. And of course, it's metaphorically spitting in your face because a lot of times they're just disrespectful in their body language and the way they talk to you. Or online, it's a mixture of talking to you and using emojis and all this stuff. You know, being trolls. Just walk away from those people. Uh, go to the ones that are more open, more reasonable. Uh, but what, like I said, what I notice with a lot of people, they may seem reasonable at first. But then the holy water, metaphorically speaking, the Holy Spirit, the word of God, touches that heart and they just start freaking out in pain, right? Sound like Bobby Bichet. But anyway, I'll stop trying to be funny. Thanks for watching. Take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12, at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. The Bible, the Scriptures, are the written Word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying, it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, 
not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who were coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written to search the scriptures, bring them up. They testify of me, right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Barians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word, and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger trying to kidnap you, right? What does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit and become one with his spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified, so that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you, and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here, John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. 
and eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7 to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name. They're prophesying in his name. They're casting out devils in his name. They're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you, because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as Adam knew Eve and she conceived, you need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. And there was a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though what he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person, and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian, and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously, he's a pompous ass, right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're immature. Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. What's up, fella?
couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So a fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest thy kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Just like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that. 